I'll teach you something. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to I'll teach, teach you something. something. <laughs> and I think today you can talk first for once. Sure. <laughs> um, so after last episode, um, I decided to pick uh, maybe a little lighthearted topic. Um, <laughs> and a topic that always puzzled me every time I went to one of their restaurants. And it's the idea of, like, how do buffets, all-you-can-eat buffets, make money? Now, it's kind of an obvious thing, you know. Low-end food. Low -end. <laughs> <laughs> but there are some less than noticeable things that people realize about buffets. I mean, first and foremost, yes, it's not the best food in the whole wide world, but... It's all you can eat, and people go there, and they enjoy copious amounts of it, which makes you think, like, how does anyone make any money off of this? Because there's people that can eat seven, eight, nine, ten plates of food. I remember going to, like, a buffet once, and I think it was with, was it with you, where, like, there were two men, and they were just eating, like, endless amounts of, like, crab legs like that was <laughs> yeah. the only thing they took from the buffet and they would stack their plate like you know like several inches high like maybe a foot and a half high and they just like voraciously ate these disgusting crab legs <laughs> like i don't eat like all that stuff yes. like, especially at a buffet like and it was really weird yeah and that's pretty much textbook of any buffet and then there was that woman at that other buffet that we went to that just had an entire plate of mashed potatoes do you remember oh, that oh yes that yes i do remember that one. i mean you do meet some interesting characters I at you, buffets you could make a really cool documentary that was just like case studies in a buffet and like you would just <laughs> talk to weird people with their weird foods like and what their preferences oh. are and things like that but yeah. yeah i mean back 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 to the topic Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, let's take for instance, let's let's just go to crab legs, right? Crab legs themselves are they don't have a lot of meat on them, right? It seems like a very expensive food. But when bought frozen and also in bulk, yeah. They're very cheap. And that's one of the biggest things about like even though it's cheap food, people don't realize that how much money they have to spend in bulk to get a cheap discount to make a profit margin off of it. Um, so things like crab legs are an enticing thing to get people in the door of uh, buffets. That's like this episode of, like, I'm a nerd and I love Spongebob. And there's this episode where they make Krabby Patties literally out of, like, slimy garbage. But then, like, they paint it to look like a Krabby Patty. And I feel like that's where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be traumatized. No, um, I mean, I'm sure that there are some segments of restaurants that try to do that. I mean, obviously, you know, people, f you know, serve food that is supposed to be something else into something else like as we heard in that that uh popular i believe it was npr um this american life where they found out that squid rings uh, could also be you want to go there <laughs> okay guys pork bung hole is that what they call it pork bungs yeah pork bu oh yeah i'm just adding hole because that's what it is <laughs> squid rings are not squid they are the bum hole of a pig. Technically, in, yeah, for... Sometimes. Sometimes. But Not I believe, all the time. I believe all the time, but sometimes. <laughs> but, um, you know, anyways, um, so the type of food that they serve may seem high-end, but, you know, like crab, like you said, those king crab legs, bought in bulk and frozen they are fairly cheap. You know, I feel like we didn't give any context at all to what we just said about pork bung. And now so many people are no longer even listening to us. They're just like, oh my God, what the heck are they talking about? But anyways, continue. <laughs> but, um, so the thing of it is, is that they buy things in bulk and, you know, they have huge storage to buy things in bulk. Yeah. 
Um, they choose menu items that are also interchangeable, right? So you'll see a chicken dish basically done two, three, four different ways. Thank God for that. Like corporate Canada and corporate America must be so excited. I once had a job where they served a pita wrap and there were 12 different ones and they were all chicken something. And every day the lineups for these chicken Caesar wrap, chicken korma wrap, like it's all the same thing. It's just a different sauce. Just a different sauce. Yes, correct. Yeah. So yeah, they use things that are, can be interchangeable. Um, because obviously, waste is something that uh, you don't want in any restaurant, let alone a buffet restaurant where people can eat whatever they want, leave it on their plate or whatever. And you'll see sometimes, excuse me, with buffets that, you know, they have these rules where they actually charge you. For what you don't eat. For what you don't yeah. eat. Which is kind of, you know... Those ones stress me out, but like... Not the buffets ones. Well, I guess they're like buffets, but like the ones that are like the Japanese like plate kind of like you order. Like how how do I know how many plates we're going to eat? Like how many little plates of three things? Like it's so stressful. <laughs> yes. And hopefully your dining experience isn't stressful. <laughs> and I am a notorious over food preparer yes. so i have to not apply my army like feeding skills while i'm at a buffet or i'm gonna need to carry like yeah. a big purse everywhere i go so that i don't have to pay more money for my dinner so yes exactly but let me get to the next thing so one of the more not so obvious uh things that a buffet does is their layout if you ever notice on a buffet where it starts and where it ends Okay, you notice that the starchy, cheaper, carb-laden things usually start at the beginning. Yeah. It's because they want you to load up on rice, uh, cheaper things like potatoes or the lo mein noodles or things like that because those are more filling mm -hmm. than the more expensive proteins that you see like the, I mean... Like, for instance, at Mandarin, the, the the prime rib is in the corner. Yeah. You know, so... And you have to ask to get it cut And you off. have to ask to get and it cut. And they always cut a piece that is paper thin and has, like, 300% fat slab <laughs> attached to it. And I'm like, ugh, thanks. Yeah. Ugh. And um, so, so the very layout itself uh, lends itself to being, like, you get filled up on cheaper things, where rice is you know, less than 12 cents a pound, kind of, like, cheap. Understandable. You know, versus things like chicken. Yeah. Um, and even then, like, especially the Chinese buffet, which usually this is a, the, the most... Uh, common. Common uh, all-you-can-eat buffet scenario. Uh, things like sweet and sour chicken and lemon chicken. You notice how much breading is on oh, that chicken? Yeah. I, I just think, like, I've become a lot more sensitive to the quality of things like that. Like, I don't know, it, it creates, like, some weird paranoia inside me that I don't even necessarily know what I'm paranoid about. But, like, it bothers me that there's this big, thick, bready, sweet thing. And inside it is this, like, not only minuscule, but rubbery, creepy piece of meat. Like, and, and it's, <laughs> it could be anything. I could be eating a naked mole rat. It, it's like, who knows? No, it, most likely it's chicken, but it, it's about a 50-50 blend of like, chicken and deep say, fried. Like, this isn't just buffets or just any particular, like, Chinese, Japanese, American, whatever. It's also, like, frozen food in general. I'm starting to feel like things are getting more sketchy. Like, I don't know. It creeps me out, though. Yeah, and, and you know, this, this also applies to different types of buffets. Like, I mean, a very, very popular buffet that's not in Canada, but in the United States is the Golden Corral, which is American-style food. Honestly terrified. <laughs> You're terrified? Don't they have, like, a thing where, like, you can't get in until you have, like, a, an arm bracelet or something? There's something no, no. strictly, so, weirdly American about this well, one. Well, this brings me to my next point. Like, so, at Golden Corral... Um, you have to usually buy a drink before you pay for your admission mm -hmm. into the thing. So, uh, into the buffet where you get to eat like a, you know, a pig. <laughs> but, uh, so the, the drinks themselves, 
super markup on the drinks. I feel um, like the Golden Corral should just be called like the sad human state of affairs. Because <laughs> I went there one time and it was just like, why are we here? What are we doing? Like, why are all these people here? None of us should be here. <laughs> because it's cheap food and it's plentiful. Yeah, it actually was good too, and there was some good food too. There wasn't just terrible food. Like, yeah, I mean, and again, it if it ticks off the boxes of is it deep fried golden delicious? Is it? Uh... Except I did get stuck in like a church lineup of people waiting for prime rib or steak or something. Steaks, yeah, like random meats, and it was like it was so crazy how long the lineup was. So don't go during church post church. And that's intentional, right? It's made to order, but you have to wait for it. Mm -hmm. How often are you going to wait at a buffet? I left and came back. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to do that, but I did. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, um, hot, the M Mongolian grills, you know, where they have these big, giant, top, flat top grills where you pick the food and they cook it right in front of your eyes. Yeah. Again, it takes time. That's my favorite kind of, like, I guess buffet. It's not really a buffet as much as a, I don't know, it's just a different food experience. But that's my favorite. And typically the 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 meat itself is razor thin. Yeah. Even if you put your whole bowl I'm full good, of I'm meat. I'm good with that, though. Like, I feel like gluttony isn't my thing anymore. Like, there's been a time I think it was, but it's not anymore. Like, I'm over it, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, for the purposes of a buffet, right, the mindset of people going to a buffet is like, I'm going to get my money's oh, worth. Oh, there's people who don't eat all day. I know <laughs> Yeah, and they'll <laughs> intentionally starve themselves yes. to eat a buffet. I'm not saying I do this. Okay, <laughs> I do this. Okay, <laughs> I do this. <laughs> but, yeah. but uh, you know, so, like at the Mongolia, it, it takes a while, right? And yeah. then, of course... The main portion of what they're cooking for you, made to order, is noodles. Yeah. Or rice. Or the cheaper things like cabbage and yeah. onion and things like that. So, um... I'm really excited I graduated to the level of adult that I now like cabbage. Cooked cabbage. <laughs> it's weird. I know. It is It is a very weird thing. It doesn't... It still doesn't smell good when it no. gets cooked, but... Uh, I just used to look at it like I look at Brussels sprouts, which is that... It tastes how fart smells, but like, I like yeah. it now. Yeah, the smell is what always got to me, but uh, now, um, now I quite enjoy it. Yeah, sans the smell. <laughs> but uh, so, drink markups, okay? Four dollars for a soft drink, which is also free refills, bottomless refills. Okay, it doesn't even cost ten cents. For a cup of soda. And you usually notice that the cups are very small. I learned that from, like, every guy I ever knew who worked at McDonald's. And they would tell me, like, the, the unit prices of things. That's, like, a thing for McDonald's people. Like, they learn all this stuff and then they tell you all about it. It's really funny. <laughs> well, and see, at McDonald's, too, right? Part of the element of their like the restaurant. the cost and the pop cost and, like, all the... <laughs> yeah, the, the cup actually costs more. Yeah, I know. Um, than, than the soda itself. We all dated that McDonald's employee in high school. <laughs> we all know this. <laughs> and, and McDonald's has that model where, where some of the McDonald's, they have the, the drink fountains where you can get, you know, free refills yeah. inside the restaurant. I mean, not all of them have it, but some do. So they have to take that into account. The reason that they can do that is because the markup is like 1,500% yeah. on, on the drink itself. Yeah. So that's a big way of how buffets make their money is through just charging an exorbitant amount with a drink. And as you're drinking more, you're eating less. I only ever drink water, though, at a buffet. And I mean, but that's the truth. Like, I and, and that's like all I really want to drink at restaurants now anyways. And I feel awful. It's not even about being cheap or whatever. It's just that, like, it's healthy. I, I don't want to drink soda. I don't mm -hmm. want to drink alcohol. I just want water, and I feel terrible a lot of the time going like, I'll just have a water, you know, it's like, but that's all I want. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and they they try to entice customers like yourself to drink things that are special, like if they a have Shirley a liquor, Temple. <laughs> yeah, if they have a liquor license, and liquor itself is 
already artificially marked up so much anyways yeah. to try to make it more of a special occasion. Yeah. You know, so drinks are a big thing. Um, also, notice the size of their plates. Yeah. The plates are not dinner plates. No, they're a they're little not, smaller. They're, they're almost like salad plates. Yeah. So that's another one of these small little things that you notice. That hopefully the Diabetes Corporation somehow <laughs> influenced. <laughs> yes, but uh, they do that intentionally. Yeah. Because you don't want to, you know, you're serving yourself your own food. Right? You know, and it's like you can pile it up a, a mile high, but usually the the psychology of people is that you only take a couple of pieces and then you move on. Well, some people right? do. Because like, you... I've seen both. Like, I always think, like, imagine if we loaded our plates like this at home. Like, you know. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's so different how you enter this animalistic ritual when you leave home and go to a buffet. And you're just like, I will fit as much food on this plate as is possible. You've got layers. Like, you get to the, you know, like, you that rice, that cheap layer you talk about, the carbs. Yeah. That's buried so far under, like, six layers. You've got, like, your, yeah, of your chicken crap chicken and then on top of it, yeah. you've got your, like, your vegetables and maybe you grabbed a piece of watermelon. Like, it's like a, a layer cake. Yeah. And... You know, I, you got to change your mindset in terms of <laughs> how you eat, but most people don't, right? No. They they eat like they eat at home, so they they want to make sure that their yeah. plate has evenly partitioned. I just you know, like food how, items. how you turn a buffet into like a gourmet restaurant where you get a soup first, and then you'll get like <laughs> you know. I mean, I do. I do the opposite. The weird one is like I get the carby junk, whatever the the protein, and then I have a plate of like healthy things like this is the last memory i want to have of leaving here that i ate something that was just healthy it's yeah and, this. and again it's the psychology i like the idea of like having like a starter yeah a main course and a, a dessert you know mm-hmm. a couple of main courses <laughs> if i want to be uh, be uh, honest you know because i i want to get my money's worth and then I, and people have figured out like basically on average, to get your money's worth at a buffet, you literally would have to eat... $25, you must engorge yourself half to death and, you know, lay awake all night farting in bed. Yeah, basically. basically. <laughs> yeah, basically. You'd have to eat somewhere around <laughs> eight, nine, ten plates of food. Yeah. One-tenth of your own and body weight. Or ten something. plates of protein, not, not the carby stuff, which is insane yeah you know i can't i don't know many people that can eat 10 plates of meat no but even then right you know it's like you think like okay well they must be making money hand over foot it's like not no you know they're just like any other restaurant their their margins are paper thin oh yeah and the biggest thing about buffet restaurants is they they want people in and out all the time they make money off of straight volume Every right. time I've gone to a buffet, I've, like, arrived after everyone around me, and I've left before them, too. Like, I'm, uh, I remember one time I went to that place, um, the Mongolian Grill, mm-hmm. and they gave us the, the light eaters discount. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, because I remember that. Yeah. We were just, like, in, had food and left, and, and I felt like, this is the way to do this. Like, you don't need to be here for so long, and, and no. you don't need multiple plates. Like... It's like change the psychology a little. I don't know. It's weird. Well, I mean, the thing is, to to them, it it doesn't matter about your eating habits. They basically, they have a fixed price for their buffet. Yeah. Right? So as many fixed price buffet, you know, calls you can get, take it. Yeah. You know, some people eat a lot more and some people eat a lot less because that's just the psychology of the world. Yeah. You know, so... They want to pack as much people in as possible. And they could do that because, you know, they have the space. They usually have large space and they try to get maximize their seating. They don't have to have a wait staff to uh, wait on your on your uh, customers. Yeah. The customers themselves are taking the food, right? They just have someone literally to bus tables, direct you to your chair, fill up your refills a lot. So you fill up on water or drinks or whatever you have. 
Yeah. And uh, although give I you do feel like there's like the the servers who bring you the drinks and stuff and like you know get your bill, collect your plates. There's this weirdness about that that bothers me. It's like a servitude kind of thing that I I feel uncomfortable with for some reason. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know. Like, I guess I'm thinking a lot these days more about the idea of being served anyways by, by, by a server mm. in a restaurant. It's a, it's a kind of uncomfortable concept to me these days. But, like, in buffets, it's especially weird because you feel like it's just someone, like, running behind to, like, sweep up after you and then, you know, sit down, king, eat another plate. Here I am to get your <laughs> It's a very weird thing. Yeah, you're gorging yourself <laughs> yeah. on cheap chicken yes. at the same time. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of weirdness to buffets for sure. And that's probably why I was thinking about it so much because, like, I mean, even in today's climate, you know, I mean, as we are trying to get out of this pandemic, mm-hmm. um, I believe a lot of buffets have either suffered already or... Yeah they're going to go out of business oh, and yeah. go out of fashion. Um, Unless they've dynamically been able to change to create like a, a takeout situation. But I think most would have to have already had that, like, you know, to establish. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, if you can, and if it's safe, you know, you should support your local restaurants yeah. and buffets are probably not one of those places that people are going to think about in this type of climate, Mm -hmm. Uh, which kind of makes me sad because I do like the buffet experience um, as cheap as and weird as it is. I like it too. And you know what it is? I think I like to people watch and I like watching families who make it more like it's fancier than it is kind of. And they have like their parties there. And I kind of love that. And I also love like, the singing of happy birthday out loud and other people get involved and it's nice to go with kids you know exactly. and there's a few really charming things about buffets it is Certainly. kind of community ish like oh, yeah and clean you nice talk buffets. to people yeah yeah exactly and um you know they they're really i mean i i'm afraid that they're they're going to be missed yeah um well i think one is already um is it Tucker's Marketplace has already yeah they closed down they're closing or have closed which is too bad it's like we only have like in Canada I think we have like maybe two or three established buffets we have a large Chinese one and we have a large Indian one and then Mm. like the mother Tucker's or Tucker's Marketplace as it is now was like the kind of just you know North American food one Um, yeah yeah. but um, yeah I mean and there's I mean this is more prevalent in America obviously yeah um, you know, because America is all about excess, and, <laughs> you know, and I think the uh, biggest thing about buffets too, is like, I mean, maybe not so much our generation, but we grew up with parents that believe that the amount of food, mm-hmm. quantity was, over quality, yeah, quantity over quality was the idea of like, if you're able to fill, feed an army, you know, it showed prominence, it showed that you could provide something. Yeah. Um, I mean, you feel good. You take your family out. Nobody goes home hungry. Exactly. And that's the, that's the big key. And I think that kind of way of dining is in danger right now. Yeah. Um, because of what's going on. And, uh, and that's probably another reason why I wanted to touch on it, you know, cause yeah. it's been a while since we've been to a buffet. You yeah, know? it has. And, um, yeah. And it's, kind of makes me a little sad but regardless you know i i wanted to uh touch that and um teach you something cool very cool so um what are you going to teach me today so after yeah after last last podcast i needed a little brain bleach too and so i went with something that is like super kind of cute and like a really inspiring thing for me um that i've always been very interested in and it's symbiotic relationships between animals so symbiotic or symbiosis is sort of um, also called mutualism is when two species depend on each other and um, they both benefit from having a relationship so um, that I scratch your back you scratch mine kind of thing and so um, I actually had believed in one for a long time that I debunked so I taught myself something and also um, 
I, uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot about a lot of species and stuff, but I'll try to keep it like to just the relationships because I could talk forever about how fascinating so many animals are. So I've got four examples. I didn't want to go too heavy um, because I could have, but like there are so many more examples between like than what I'll present today of species that work together. Um, So the first one is a quick one that I I just recently learned about and it's really cute. Um, It's called the Finch response and it is um, basically between the Galapagos tortoise and the Darwin finch. Um, this was discovered by Charles Darwin, actually, because it was during um, his preparatory work for writing The Origin of Species that he was, he actually discovered the Darwin Finch. That's why they're named after him. Mm-hmm. So this um, relationship was found as a result of his studying of the finch's behaviors. So what it is, is when the the Galapagos giant tortoise yes. um it will present itself in a certain posture where it raises its body up standing as like as high as it can on its four legs and it will extend its neck to its fullest reach and it will sort of just arch its neck out almost to look kind of like a tree branch to try to entice the finches to land on its neck and then the finches will land on the on the neck and they will start to um remove these little parasites like that that sit on on the tortoise and and can you know like having parasites isn't comfortable for any species no they're they're (laughs) ectoparasites and they eat them so um that's the first one it's just kind of a quick and interesting one like you you wouldn't expect that kind those two species to be together but that's why they are come on that's a very lovely pair yes so um, the next one is the mola mola or the sunfish and um, seabirds like albatross and um, sea- different kinds of seagulls. And people that don't know what a mola mola is, they're huge. Yeah, they're, the cool, they're like a frankenfish. They look like a gigantic pancake because they're like flattened from the sides. Like they look like someone put them in like a a drill press or something and just like (laughs) squash them like they're so cool looking so what they do is like they they're like the other thing about them is that they're tailless they don't have a tail so they have they look like a giant pancake with these two little fins these really um like perky big eyes and like this little tiny smile kind of this little mouth it's so cute and then they have these little bitty fins that look totally pointless and no tail so Imagine this giant, like, pancake fish. It comes <laughs> up to the surface of the water, and it lays on each side. Like, it presents its sides. So the cool thing is, is this is a relationship between an aquatic creature and, like, and an air maybe. creature, right? Yeah. Like, it's, a, it's like it's not a normal kind of symbiotic relationship. So what happens is, again, this is about the removal of parasites, but... Um, mola molas get a particularly weird parasite called the panella and what it does is it buries its head into the flesh of the victim and then it leaves a long egg string that hangs out so it looks like this long strings that come off of the bird or sorry the fish so what happens is like seabirds like the albatross and the gulls they'll swoop down and they'll pluck these crustaceous parasites and pull the panella out of the mola mola and eat it it's food for them and people don't don't know albatrosses are ginormous Huge, yeah they're like a giant seagull like, so just to get an idea of how big a mola mola is is that albatross can land on it. exactly <laughs> and so yeah that's a really really cool one um then the, what I'll do is I'll talk about the all-time world's coolest symbiosis first, and then I'll tell you about the one that I debunked. So the all-time world's coolest one is about <laughs> the Brazil nut, which you hate because, you know. Because it tastes like pencils. Exactly. So <laughs> it, does, it tastes like pencils. I don't know if this led this story will, will change how you feel about the I, Brazil nut. I don't eat pencils, by the way, people listening to the podcast. <laughs> okay, but if a pencil had a taste, it would be a Brazil nut. And <laughs> yeah. I've always said this. So they are very dry, and they definitely aren't as as good as like the other nuts in the mixed yeah, nuts box. Yeah, you should just but... basically throw them away. 
so the thing is though is that we all need to treasure them because they are outrageously hard to come by so the brazil nut tree um th this involves the brazil nut tree its flowers and seed pods a rainforest orchid called Caranthes vasquezi and the sex lives of Euglossa orchid bees. Oh, and the feeding habits of a tropical rodent called the agouti. So it's super complicated. <laughs> so the Brazil nut tree is indigenous to the Amazon rainforest in South America, and it can live a hundred years and it can grow over 150 feet tall. It's a massive tree. A single tree can produce 250 pounds of these delicious nuts every year in seed pods that weigh about five pounds a piece. And inside each one of these big seed pods that look, it looks like a cannonball. And inside there are about two dozen of these Brazil nuts. Okay. Um, so they grow in these clumps like kind of like that like each pod has its own branch so it looks like this spindly kind of thing with like five or six branches and each one has like a cannonball at the end it's really interesting um and so then that's how basically um where am I going with this? <laughs> Sorry, I lost my track of thought. Okay, so they weigh about five pounds, and <sighs> they have two dozen individual nuts inside. So this is a $50 million industry every year. Um, so people are climbing these trees and harvesting these seed pods. 150 foot tall trees. Yeah. And I'll tell you why later. It's crazy. So the existence of the Brazil nut tree is actually pretty perilous, though, despite all of this, okay, how hardy this, these nuts are. Um, and the reason why is, of course, the normal reasons, human deforestation and competing plant species, especially if you get like a introduced species, you know, it can annihilate like the Brazil nuts ability to survive. Um, so the other thing, though, is really the more important thing is that it has its own vulnerability and that's its complex method of reproduction. Like even the smallest change in ecosystem will make it so that they can't, they can't reproduce. So first of all, they only flower once every year, um, for, for one day. <laughs> so it's a, like, that is some crazy, like, you know, what is the, what, what do we do as people like ovulation? Yeah. <laughs> it's like figure that one out. Um, so it produces, um, basically a flower that is so hard and, and hardy to try to get into that only one f species can pollinate it. And that's the female Euglossa orchid bee. It's the only one that's strong enough to get the nectar inside to make pollination possible. So the existence of this muscular and finicky bee is entirely dependent on its ability to mate, which is another whole crazy situation. This female bee only mates with the best smelling of the males in her species, and she is very, very picky. So the male Euglossa orchid bees, in order to achieve this fragrance, the level of fragrance that the female requires, they spend most of their lives pollinating a very specific type of orchid called the Caranthes vesquezi. Um, this isn't at all for the nectar or pollination or anything. It's entirely about getting as much of that stink on their body as they can, getting the fragrance. The X body spray yes, of the rainforest. Absolutely. So the other thing about this bee is that it's genetically evolved to, for this purpose alone. So it has these forearms that are evolved for the purpose of getting this fragrance and then collecting it in these pockets that have evolved on its hind legs. Um, all just basically to get this smell to be chosen as a suitable mate. So after all of that happens, it still takes the seed pot a full 14 months to achieve its near five pound maturity. Um, <clears throat> and that's after the flower is pollinated. So then it becomes this big pod that like is up in this, you know, 150, 200 foot tree. 
and eventually it's going to ripen and fall. And this is like, this could kill you if it were to hit you. First, Obviously. <laughs> the weight of it and the height that it's falling from, it's like a falling cannonball. So the thing about it, though, is because it's so heavy and hard, it falls and it doesn't break. It just, it sounds amazing soaring through the trees and then it's like, boom, when it hits the ground. It's crazy. So, but it doesn't crack. There's actually only one animal on earth that can crack them. And that is <laughs> the agouti. What? So agoutis look kind of like a slightly smaller capybara or a giant rat, kind of like they're a rodent species. They're pretty cute. Um, and they have two pairs of sharp front teeth. They're like chisels. So that allows them to gnaw into the pod to get to the seeds, the, the Brazil nuts. <clears throat> but the Brazil nut specifically presents a challenge to the agouti in that it produces way more seeds than the agouti can eat. And rodents have this thing about not leaving food behind. It's like a known kind of thing. Squirrels do it. They'll try to collect everything and hide it away. The other thing they're notoriously known for is having a bad memory. So they don't remember where they, you know, like they, they will carry and uh, bury all of these additional Brazil nuts and then they'll forget about them. So that is intentional by the tree so that some of those seeds can then sprout to become new trees. So the other thing about just the perilousness of the Brazil nut industry is that humans have to climb these trees to harvest these pods. And that's what they do for consumer goods because um, traditional attempts at trying to farm these trees have failed. So even the way that like we harvest Brazil nuts nowadays is exactly the same. Like it's, it's the agouti, it's the whole relationship. So um, yeah. So I will wrap this up and give you the one that I debunked. So you know how I'm always like, oh, look at those beautiful peonies. You know that they require an ant to open them up, right? They can't, oh, like yes, a peony yes, flower yes. doesn't open up. So actually I found out that's a myth. Um, peonies don't require ants to bloom at all. Um, it's it's just that they have a mutualism. They, they can benefit from one another. Like it, it can help that the ant will eat away the green material, but it's not necessary. They will still bloom. Um, so the one thing about peony flowers is that they attract ants ants love them yeah they do yeah and so just one tip if you're growing peonies and you want to bring them in the house and not get ants in your house you're supposed to pick them and bring them in at the marshmallow stage so that's the stage where the green has opened and the um the like the what is it the the colored um petals that's the what petals i'm looking for the flower, yeah. they're visible but they're still a hard ball so they say to pick it at that stage and let it open inside your house so that the ants haven't gotten inside of it so yeah that is my teaching you something moment here <laughs> on uh, symbiotic relationships i can't i can't believe about the brazil nut i mean so much work to go in such a terrible food i know right <laughs> but anyways but now i'll i'll, I'll look at it before I throw it in the trash and be like, wow, it took a lot of time. Terrible. And effort. You have to eat them now. You have <laughs> no, to eat I, them now. No, nothing will make me eat them. I, I typically just avoid them altogether. So, but yeah, I think we have little critters in our house that are emerging, so we should wrap this up. So, thank you for recording with me today, and... Yeah, no problem. Hopefully we taught you something. Yeah, hopefully. I taught you something. <laughs>